Hi, everybody. I am Katie Zevlin, the content director of the National Glass Association and the editor-in-chief of the NGA's Glass Magazine. I'm joined today by my terrific colleague, Sarah Neiswanger, NGA's Associate Director of Industry Engagement. Uh, and this is our first episode of the NGA's and uh, the NGA's magazines, our summer video and podcast series, where we're going to be highlighting some of the really exciting uh, discussions from the Building Envelope Contractors Conference in Las Vegas. Uh, the latest BEC conference was held in March at Caesars Palace, and it was the 25th anniversary of the conference. So, Sarah, you and I have, have been attending BEC for a long time. You've been really closely involved with the program for many years. Tell me a little bit about some of your main takeaways from the show. Yeah, I will say um, it's hard to believe this was my 16th time you know, getting to attend and participate in the planning of the BEC conference. You've been around even longer, I might add. So um, I will say it is so fun to see this event and industry generally thriving right now. Um, this event is a great reflection of what seems to be happening in the industry. Um, so we had near record attendance. Folks were engaged in the sessions. They were really engaged um, in making and strengthening their connections out in the tabletop area and receptions. So the energy and the overall mood was just excellent, uh, and people were really happy to be there, which always makes us happy to see. So one thing that was, you know, because this was our 25th anniversary, our our uh, really in incredible and, you know, the industry's favorite, Max Perelstein, he was our MC, and he revisited uh, the top 10 challenges list. So these were the top 10 challenges that that contract lasers, that attendees of that very first conference uh, remarked upon. And he brought those back at, at uh, this event. Uh, and it, we, we were all struck by, um, by frankly, how many repeats there were. Uh, what were your thoughts on that top 10 list? Yeah, I, to your point, like we know the saying, the more things change, the more they say the same. And that, wow, this definitely demonstrated that. I think I would venture to say there are moments where improvements are made um, and the industry takes two steps forward, but then recessions hit or material shortages happen um, and progress can digress a bit. And so hence we we come back to a lot of familiar topics. Um, I think, you know, whether it was the lack of commitment or product knowledge from uh, design partners, whether they're general contractors or architects, um, design details, ramifications of design build process. Uh, a lot of these are familiar um, that we try to, to hit on, you know, at multiple uh, BEC conferences over the years. But um, the the last one, the number one on the list was building a quality workforce, which, which brings us to where we are today. <laughs> Yes, yeah, a standout session from the BEC conference. It was the panel that you moderated. It was the capstone session of the BEC. It was called Five Ways to Address Generational and Mentorship Gaps. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about the session and how it came to be? Yeah, this is one that seemed to snowball together quite easily. Um, just for a little bit of background, after every conference, we do ask attendees feedback and we truly use it. And this is the perfect example of how it all came together well. Um, folks have recently been able to give some really detailed, concrete feedback that helped us, you know, identify culture, recruitment, and training um, were, were important. Um, the positive effects of a diversified workforce. Um, and then one key part that really helped shape this session was how to deal with retirements. Um, and you know, keeping the momentum going um, as generations kind of move out of the workforce. So as a staff, we identify patterns and make recommendations to a volunteer planning task group that we work with. Uh, and this one really hit a chord. They helped us build off of it. They could relate to it themselves. Um, so that really helped us hone in on three concrete areas of succession planning, recruitment and retention, and training. Um, and best of all, it's just highly actionable. And our panelists were able to share actual details um, that they incorporate into their work life too. So yeah, I liked that. I liked that a lot about this this session and all of them. You know that that folks were able to come away with true strategies to bring back and, and to make an, an impact on their businesses right off. Definitely. So 
you know, thanks go to Jeff Haber of W and W Glass, Joey Aragon of Aragon Construction, and Taylor Anderson at Anderson Aluminum for just knocking this one out of the park. The added cool factor is that all three of these individuals work for family-owned businesses, so um, these hit close to home for them because they're they're living it out among their own parents, their siblings, their children as we speak. Um, so it made it all the more relatable and interesting to listen to. So let's let's kind of dig into it. So our, our first episode today of this summer series, we're going to be diving in to um, one, one portion of that conversation. Specifically, we'd like to highlight uh, W&W Jeff Haber's discussion of how his company uh, became an ESOP, uh, adopting an employee stock ownership plan. They're not the first ESOP in the industry. Sarah, you and I were, were chatting uh, or messaging back and forth prior to this meeting. Uh, Salem, they became an ESOP, gosh, I think back in 2005-ish. Uh, Drew Glass um, was really a, a, a wonderful um, information provider for, for us at the NGA and Glass Magazine as we were doing our coverage on ESOPs as they became an ESOP. Um, oh gosh, that must have been nearly 10 years ago. Um, so this is a concept that's out there, but it was really helpful to have Jeff uh, talk through the challenges of transferring ownership to the next generation of the difficulties for company executives in determining what's next, both for their businesses, but also what's for them, what's next for themselves, uh, and maintaining a strong company culture throughout all of these transitions. Um, so I thought this was just such a stellar um, bit of content. Um, thanks to Jeff for sharing this and, you know, thank, thanks to you for organizing this Really awesome panel. Um, do you want to to send us into the video of Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jeff is very direct and relatable and empathetic, and you can tell he's passionate about the industry. Um, so his approach to this called out how it's a great way to also manage manage emotions, take the emotion out of some of these hard business decisions that are often um, managed with family. And and as he says very well, it may not actually be your, your biological family, but your industry becomes your family, your coworkers become your family. So this is um, a great way to uh, keep everybody front of mind and make sure that they all feel a part of the uh, culture and invested in the company's future. So with that, uh, we'll let Jeff take it away. So I'm Jeff Haber from WW Glass based in New York. And, uh, I guess technically I'm a third generation uh, owner operator uh, from W&W. So we are the largest glazing contractor based in New York City. Our company was originally started as a storefront uh, glass and glazing operation by my grandfather in the 1940s. The exact year is still unknown to us since uh, we never met him. Um, it used to be called Haber and Henry Glass and Metal. My father and my uncle started W&W &W 45 years ago in 1978. Um, my brothers and I, Mike and Scott, and my first cousin Howard, Mike and Scott are here, uh, bought the company from them in 2004. Um, subsequent to that, we have several uh, fourth generation uh, Habers here who have decided to enter this fantastic business that we all love. Um, and we had to make a decision. We had to figure out what are we going to do. Um, you can't live forever as much as we would all love to. This industry has a way of kind of having its way with you. At a certain point, you have to decide what are you going to do? Are you going to just go to the end? We've seen many people just stay in this business until they're, you know, mm -hmm. 85, 90 years old. They never give up the reins. They never give up control and it becomes a problem. Um, so we really started to think about what can we do? And we dabbled with some different ideas and people have approached us over the years and you know, we, we held them off. Really for us, we are not capable of doing anything else. But I think when you've been in the glass business for 30 or 40 years, you realize this is what you do. It's kind of in your blood, it's in your bones. We did it in high school, we did it in college, and this is what we've been trained to do. So for us, we wanted something that would allow us to stay in the business, stay in the industry, do the things that we've basically been good at doing, 
um, but still allow the company to go on the way that it's been. So transferring ownership to the employees while still giving the rest of our family members, our next generation, an opportunity to ultimately have a stake in the company down the road seemed like the best of both worlds. So it gave us an opportunity to have a smooth transition where we could stay. And that was because if you do one of these other, um, you may affect the culture. Everyone talks about the culture of your company and everybody's company is different. You've all got your own culture. And it's been cultivated over generations, whether it was your, if you were a founder, you've established that culture. If you got into it from your parents or whoever started your company, that culture has been developed over decades. So it was really critical to us that that culture stay in place because that's what established that business. So when we ultimately did this, you know, for us, the key was when we, when we ultimately got into the ESOP, we decided that becoming employee owners for the, for the employees and for us, now everyone's interests were aligned. So all the profits basically go back to the employees in the form of the stock price. So to take a step back as far as an ESOP goes, I'm not gonna get into an ESOP discussion here, but everybody is, is a beneficial owner of the shares. You don't directly own the shares, you're a beneficial financial interest in the shares. And it, there's financial calculations on how all well that works, but basically, the harder the employees work and the more profitable the company is, the better their overall package will be in the long term. It's a retirement plan for the, for the employees. So it's a powerful tool that you can use for recruitment and retainment of, the, uh, of your workers. So to have this extra benefit is something that a lot of companies can't offer. So it really is something that you can use um, for retention. And the other benefit is, is if you're unfortunately live in a high tax state like I do, or like New York, New Jersey, California, some of the other states, um, the government gives you this opportunity to pay a massive amount of taxes. But if you create this retirement plan, they waive those taxes. So there's a huge benefit there to creating this ESOP. But most importantly, it takes the pressure out of what ultimately will be a very stressful family fight down the road when you need to exit this business, because we're all gonna exit one way or the other, whether we like it or not. And it's not just a blood family. A lot of people in this room own companies that they started, they, they're not brothers and sisters, they're not husband and wives, but maybe they were two partners that got, that got together right. and they started a company and they grew it. You spend more time at work than you do at home with your family. So that's your new family. Mm -hmm. And when you go to exit that company and you go to split it up, it, it becomes, it can become incredibly divisive. Doing this, ESOP, to us, solved that problem. It took that huge obstacle off the table and allowed us to focus on running our business. It also gave us the opportunity to transition, basically, to that next generation and think about, okay, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Let's think about how do we develop our young talent, um, the kids that we have coming up, the younger employees that we hired, put in a training program, get them educated so that we can ultimately take a step back run our business the way we want to run our business and bring these guys up in the ranks and gals and figure out how are we going to start winding down as they start winding up and do that transition in a nice, safe, long-term way. Um, other alternatives that everybody has, you could sell your company to private equity, you could sell it to a strategic buyer, you could merge with another company, you could do a partial sale. Problem for us was, and I think for a lot of people who are self-made people who own their own glazing company, is you'd have to ultimately work for somebody else and do things the way they want it done, not the way you want it done. And that's a big problem, I think, yeah. you know, for, for, for our folks. Go one more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ultimately I'll leave you with a couple of pieces of information. Um, we don't have a lot of time to get into the, into the weeds here. You know, identify your goals. Figure out what is it that you want to do. For us, we wanted to seamlessly transition. We didn't want this to be disruptive to our business. We didn't want to mess with the brand equity that we've built up over the 30 years that I've been there and the decades before that, that my father and uncle had run this business. We wanted to protect our employees because that's who helped us build this business, our customers, um, as well as our kids, the next generation of people there. So it really gave us the best of all worlds. Um, engage with professionals. Don't be afraid to spend money on accountants and lawyers. They will be your best friends in the end. Seek out other people. Talk to other people who have done this. 
Um, and the other thing is you got to develop a plan. And do it when you're in a calm, relaxed way where you don't have a lot of pressure on you to start thinking about it. Because you want to do it when it's up to you to do it. Don't do it when you're forced to do it. God forbid you're sick or someone else is threatening to leave or you got a lot of pressure on you because then you're going to make a mistake and you're going to regret it. You only get one chance to do it the right way. So I, I will leave you with that. So that's all for our first episode in the NGA Summer Series. Thanks so much for tuning in. And be sure to check out the second episode, which will feature insights from BEC panelist Joey Aragon on the keys to developing a successful mentorship program. For more from the BEC, and of course for all resources and updates from the National Glass Association, you can visit glass.org. Have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you next time.